We are live. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Literary Roadhouse Book Club. Today, we're discussing Inheritance by Lan Samantha Chang. I'm Anais, and today our guest host is Tamara Woods, author of The Shaping of an Angry Black Woman. She has been writing for over 20 years and founded a poetry journal. You may have heard her on our short story podcast as a guest, and she's working with us behind the scenes to publish a poetry podcast soon. So happy to have you back on the book club. How are you today, Tamara? I'm good. How are you? Oh, did it just freeze? No. No, it didn't freeze. <laughs> it just froze. Okay, it's back. Go. Famous ah. last words. Ah. Ah. <laughs> what is going it's okay. It's okay. She'll be back. We can get the show on the road. She'll be back. I got faith in us. I got faith. <laughs> you know, it's gonna be fun when I'm in a third world country too, and two out of your co-hosts are gonna be in a third world country. That's gonna be fun for recording. <laughs> Hi, this is Annie East from Costa Rica, and this is Maya from India. <laughs> Great for sound quality. <laughs> yeah, it's just you, babe. <laughs> and we do have a couple listeners. Um, just go ahead and hold tight. We're gonna get the show on the road very, very soon. We are going to be doing a discussion of Lance Mantha Chang's Inheritance, which I'm really looking forward to. So she better get back in here because I want to talk about this book. I had a book too. Oh, I like your cover. Your cover is better than the American cover. This is what our cover looked like. Yeah, it's pretty. Oh. Oh, no. I take off my dust jackets because I'm a disaster. I mean, even <laughs> taking it off, it's still like a mess. I don't know how people <laughs> read books and then afterwards it looks like new. Because when I'm done reading a book, it looks like I've given it to a kindergartner. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I didn't even read it with this on for more than five minutes, and I still got frayed on the edge. Wow. Literally, like, less than a half an hour. <laughs> it's pointless. <laughs> this one came with a frayed edge. But they put the sticker on it. So now it's going to... Yeah, I had to be really careful to peel my sticker, because this is one of the few books I'm keeping. When I leave, I'm not keeping many books, but uh, I am keeping this one with me. Actually, I'm keeping both of her books with me. I haven't read anything from her before. I've read um, one from her. Sounds like I'm in a zoo. No, it's just you, babe. It is just you. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, is it just me? No, it's just you. Tamara, are those birds in your garden or something? I don't know where they are. Oh, I never see them. I just don't hear them often. Going, oh, oh, that sort of. <laughs> They're very vocal at all times of day. So here is the other book of hers. It's a really quick read. Read it in one night. Oh, All forgotten. Forgotten. Nothing Nothing is lost. Completely changed my writing life. Okay, I can hear you guys now. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Do we not to be graced with your beautiful presence? I can see you guys, but I can't see myself. Yeah, I can't see you either. Poor internet signal. <sighs> and that wind sound is killing my eardrums. I don't think that's on my end, but no, I hear it too. It is so loud. It's just right in my ears. <laughs> you know what I liked about Hangouts was that I could lower the broadcast. I wish Blab did that. Maybe we can send a suggestion. Like we could, we could say just set, you know, don't bother the video, just sound or whatever. I don't have anything. You can't else. do that. I think you can actually. Where? Um. Uh, no. Let me see her. I'm checking something. Actually, you can. If you okay. go to the little microphone and you click on it, mm -hmm. at the top of the microphone, you see what she saw where it says continue adding a 
that always block camera and microphone access. Ignore that. At the bottom, it says manage media settings. If you I click don't that, have that, are you in Chrome? No, I'm in Firefox. <sighs> Firefox people? Lab works funky with Firefox. Yeah, but Chrome is a RAM hog and makes my computer just... I know, up. and Firefox is just is, is actually Chrome with a few alterations. Let me see mm. if I can edit it in Firefox's settings. Why is this happening, though? I, I don't know. It was fine until we needed it to be. If, okay, I'm going to pause this recording while you guys yeah. figure out the sound. This is recording. We are live. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Literary Roadhouse Book Club. Today, we're discussing Inheritance by Lance Samantha Chang. I'm Anise. Our guest today is Tamara Woods, the author of The Shaping of an Angry Black Woman. She's been writing for over 20 years and founded a poetry journal. You may have heard her on our short story podcast as a guest, and she's working with us behind the scenes to publish a poetry podcast soon. We're so happy to have you on the book club, Tamara. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Good. Excited to discuss this book. And of course, we also have our imitable and lovely regular hosts, Maya and Gerald. Hey, guys. How are you? <laughs> Gerald is showing off his fancy UK cover. <laughs> I'm, showing, I'm showing off the fact that I've got a real book with real pages. Actually, all of us do. Yeah. It's, no, it's I have an e-book. Oh, you, oh, oh, really? You got, a, you got the e-book? Yeah. Well, that's surprising. Usually you're a hardback person. Well, yeah, it's what I can get here on time for the book club. <laughs> there is that. <laughs> this came secondhand through, through Amazon, which was a good anyway. Well, let's, let's stop top level as we always do with Tamara. What did you think of the book overall? I love how it was written. It's so beautiful. Um, I want to read the last 10 chapters again. <laughs> like, if, I don't know. I really liked it. Yeah. Like, this was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Maya, you look like you're bursting. Go. <laughs> I am bursting because I love this book with so much passion. And um, I had been wanting to read it, but I just hadn't gotten the time. And when I was reading it, it just felt delicious. Mm. Gerald? Yeah. Um, to, to be honest, I had a little trouble at the start because I, I, I'm, I'm so old, I have difficulty concentrating on too many characters at the same time. <laughs> Especially but, when they all had similar names. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and none of them are Anglo Saxon as well. So, it, you know, it's a huge problem. But, but it must be said that. Um, because it was a book club, I persevered and stuck with it, and and I just felt myself being drawn into the story. It, it's, it's it's just a family story, but it's, it's so much more than that. I love it. And yeah, like tomorrow, I, I want to read the whole sort of back quarter, uh, rear quarter again because it's it's you know I just couldn't stop turning the page. Yeah, like like Gerald, I'll admit that in the beginning it was a little slower, but once it comes to Tamara's end, I'll just go from the top. I'll say, um, like Gerald, it was a little slow for me in the beginning, but then once it sort of drew me in, it was absolutely spectacular um i found myself arguing with the characters or agreeing with them as if i was like watching like jerry springer sometimes i was just like yes absolutely. other times like no right um it froze again <laughs> i don't know if that'll help at all but i close my front door I think, I think so, that yeah. helped a lot <laughs> <laughs> oh there we go i don't know why oh, oh. We're just going to have to suffer through this. And she needs to plug herself in. I know she hates it, but she needs to plug herself in. Or else she's going to have to edit this. So I guess, like, if she wants to suffer, <laughs> it's on her. <laughs> too real. <laughs> too real. <laughs> Oh, 
<laughs> this is what happens when you've been hanging out for too many days late at night on black girl blabs. <laughs> uh, I, I have never tried blab before. This is like a whole new thing. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, we can if this. she wants to stay on Wi Fi. She'll have she to open doesn't. up the hangout. She probably won't. No, I, I, I do think that it is probably a Wi Fi issue. Not yeah. that the Wi Fi is bad, but Lab is a Wi Fi hog. I've noticed that. Good lord! What the hell is that? I think it's ambient noise. I'm like, is it me? I'm like yeah. checking my all my settings. <laughs> and now everybody's frozen. <laughs> Yeah, if we need to move this to Hangouts, you can go ahead and set up a Hangout at Annie's. She's, um, she's it kind of sucks because people are wanting to watch, but I don't know what else to do if she can't move everything to a, a hard um, cable. Because the last thing she needs is to be sitting here trying to cobble together a podcast out, of, cobble together a one-hour podcast out of a three-hour recording. Not fun. <laughs> so not what she needs in her life. <laughs> I know we're having problems keeping Annie in the room. Um, she it keeps logging her out, and so we're wonder we're not sure if we're actually going to be able to do it here. If we do move, we'll move to Google Hangouts, and we'll go ahead and put the link in this blab so that you guys can see where we went to. But I'm not sure what's happening. Well, I think right now I have audio, so maybe I'll just do this without my face. Or is yeah. that too sad? No, it's okay. Yeah. It is a little sad, but it's okay. I'm all right with it, just because... Yeah. Whatever like works. Keep tempting fate. Okay. Yeah, tempting so, fate's no fun. Yeah. So did you guys hear what I said? I, don't have to, I already repeated it twice. <laughs> um, I didn't hear what you said. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Okay. No, I didn't So what I said it. was... Um, like Gerald, the beginning was a little slow for me, but then once it sucked me in, it sucked me in completely. And I was sucked in by the characters more so than the plot, which we can discuss a little bit later, each character individually, because that's, I think, the real meat of it. Um, but I found myself kind of like agreeing or arguing with the book in a good way. Like I was very engaged. Yeah, this was a very engaging book. Um, I didn't have any problems with the beginning, but that might be because I've read her before. Mm -hmm. And I I like the slower unfolding story that this book had. One of the things that struck me was how powerful the characterizations were mm -hmm. and how powerful the language was to the point where it almost felt like this character driven story. But then when you look at the plot, there's a really strong plot. And this is what I like about her. This is why I recommended this book. This is why I wanted her to be my teacher for the writer's conference is because she combines a really strong story plot with really strong literary writing. You know, a lot of literary books are, it's one or the other. You either got a plot or you got the writing or, you know, but to combine them both and to do it in this slow unfolding way and have it not be boring, have it not stall like Fates and Furies. We didn't have those spots where you stalled out because everything, there was lulls. This just, it had a really consistent pacing. And I feel like every time I read her book, either of her two novels, I learn so much about writing. Yeah, so I think I think you're right about the character and the plot thing. Um, and maybe you'll disagree, but I think maybe the best way to start discussing this book is to start by discussing Junan, because in many ways, it's the story of Junan, right? Um, so I guess I just kind of want to open it up to like, how did you guys feel about her story, her characterization, who she is? <coughs> yeah, she's she's. It's it's quite hard because she's such a com. They're all quite complex characters, aren't they? And and mm -hmm. and they all have. I mean, I I 
the characterization was so strong for all of the all of the main characters um but she Junan was was i think she she struggled with so much didn't she um being the older sister um and and bearing that responsibility being the oldest child um so she but she was strong right through to the end very very almost resolute yeah i felt like um she was a very realistic complex character i feel like i've seen women like this and her her covering of her vulnerabilities with this strength that is actually self-destructive was very powerful for me to read and it felt very honest and and delicately written i didn't feel like I didn't feel like she was written with a ton of judgment. I felt like it was just the way things were and it was left up to me to discover how I felt about her. So just as she was complex, my feelings about her were just as complex. Yeah, so that's kind of what I want to unpack because I think we were talking about this complication and she's possibly the one that is, in my opinion, hardest to both like and dislike. Like, she's so complex that it's hard to come down one way or the other about her. Um, Tamara, how did you feel about Junan as you read her story? My feelings about her changed. Depending upon whose point of view and what was happening. I found her views on love and vulnerability and your emotions really compelling and I could understand her view even when I totally disagreed with and I was telling her just don't (laughs) don't do this you can't control everything stop (laughs) yeah Yeah, I I did a lot of um, cursing to myself you know because I could see how her need to control was pushing away the thing that she was trying to prevent, you know, and that grasping and um, yeah, it was powerful. Yeah. And, and there was that moment um, when Liang realized that um, what was the line? It was that she did not trust a single thing she could not control. It was one of Liang's, in my opinion, few epiphanies. He was like a very <laughs> simple, yes. you know, um, but I think it was it Nail was on spot it. on. <laughs> huh? It was totally spot on. It was almost too spot, spot on. on. It was just mm. so just that's the way it is. And and it was backed up. What I liked about her though is I think it would have been really easy to write this character in a way that made her very unsympathetic and made you hate her. And even at her worst, I felt so sorry for her because she was in this situation that in modern day, she could have been just as hurt, but perhaps she would have had more options. You know, Um, she could have gotten out of it. Um, Maybe she wouldn't have had the same damage that got passed down this generational, multi-generational scar. Um, that was the other thing I really loved about the book was was how we saw the trauma go from one generation to the next, you know. Um, and so because she was complex, it allowed me to get mad at her and to hope her husband left her, which I didn't expect to ever think. And um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He didn't need to be with her. He, they didn't need to be together. They weren't supposed to be together. But she needed to find a love of her own. It made me really sad that she didn't. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can, we can talk about that more, but I, I felt like in the circumstances during a war, when you have your like class fleeing the mainland, going to Taiwan, this is not the time to be abandoning your daughters. And even if you're not in love with your wife and you're in love with someone else, like I, I I was actually very upset when he left her. I'm like, this is not the time. (laughs) You know what? I think it was the perfect time because in that situation, that's when you realize what's really important. And to be with somebody that you are not in love with and that you don't even really like anymore and to give up the love of your life, Mm -hmm. that was her choice. 
she wanted everybody to go to the U.S. That was her choice not to accept that her husband couldn't be with her. She laid down that. He was perfectly willing for everybody to go. He could have been, you know, co-parent, you know, that whole business. But she was too angry and too hurt to let go. And so, Dara, no, I don't blame think? him for that. Yeah, Dara, what I... do you think as our resident man? <laughs> so that's what you I don't have. stick up for me, man. <laughs> don't let me be the dude on this show. Um, yeah, I, I'm... I, I just I, something occurred to me while others were speaking. Um, one of the things I loved about this book is that the author never intruded. I never felt like I was reading somebody's written output. It, 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 it was totally transparent. Um, so, so the so the author wasn't judging, um, wasn't judging you, man. Um, and and it, it, she was just being laid bare for the reader. To judge, and I, and I question why she sent her little sister to be with her husband, and to to be, um, you know, to be there to, to sort of look after him. And, uh, I I just thought, why would you do that? Why? She did it because she didn't think her sister was a threat because she didn't really see her sister as a full human being. You know, she had this perception that her sister was damaged in some way and unable to love in that way. She wasn't a grown woman. Like she didn't perceive her sister as a grown woman with her own needs, desires, and passions. And so when she sent her sister to go look after her husband, she didn't perceive that as a threat at all. She thought if she's there, he can't be doing anything. I don't know. I think that's a bit harsh. I think I don't think it's that she didn't see her sister as a full person. I mean, maybe there's some amount of like my little sister who has never really had a romance kind of thing going on. But I think more than anything, she just trusted her sister, trusted her so fiercely. Did you think it was trust or did you think it was trust in herself that she knew who her sister was and could control that? I don't think she actually trusted her sister. I think that she controlled her sister. I mean, she was definitely, she, she controlled everyone around her. But I think in that control, it's like if she's looking at her chess pieces, she looks at the chess piece of her sister. She's like, this one is loyal. Like, I think, I think that, because there's that summary at the end after Junan dies where um, it's like she, what she expected of people was unfaltering loyalty. And then she goes through all the ways that everybody has failed her from her own mother to her daughters to her sister to her husband. Um, it's that betrayal. So I think I think she does see everything through that betrayal. Like but she what about it. when the sister, when Yunnan, I, I hope I'm Yunnan. pronouncing it, Yunnan, yeah, when Yunnan yeah. goes to the house yeah. and she's pregnant and she is trying to explain to her sister that this wasn't just a silly thing, that she has emotions, and her sister brushed off the entire idea as if, oh, you, 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 you're young and inexperienced, you don't know what you're talking about. I wouldn't even let her say what she needed to say. That to me told me that she didn't think that her sister was was more than a child. Like she treated her sister like a kid. And she didn't think her sister could fall in love, that if this happened, it just was an indiscretion, it was hormonal, she'll get over it. Do, do yeah. You I Sorry, do, do you sorry. I was just I was just gonna say that um, I read it as denial, but I'm wondering how Tamara read it. That was kind of like the women's side, the <laughs> drama between women. I thought that the, she did, didn't want to hear the truth. That denial, it's, yeah. That it's much easier to just shut her sister down. I forgive you. I forgive him. Everything's fine. Let's continue. Let's pretend none of this happened as much as we possibly can. I will control this. Everything's fine. Let's just go. I felt like even in some ways that that she knew that there would be some type of sexual action that was going to happen between her sister and her husband. She didn't anticipate the emotion, but I think she thought the physical was going to happen. And she wanted to control who he was going to be with. Ooh, that's an interesting perspective. Well, she says that, doesn't she? Mm. She does She does write that. She does write like, okay, it's possible he's going to stray anyway that far away. I'll just kind of throw Yanan in front of him 
So that's kind of I, I had see, a very I similar reading for Tamara. As that. I read it as she if that she would be her eyes and ears. That's interesting. Oh, I mm -hmm. like that. Now I want to read the book mm -hmm. again. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Gerald, you were going to say before I wanted to get the girls in. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember what I was going to say. Um, but yeah, that's, that's an interesting reading of it. Um, because I, as, as the, the little sister was going to be the eyes and ears, although there was, and I can't remember the, 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 the exact wording there, but there was a sort of an insinuation that, that Yunnan suspected that, that he might be straying in fact, she she knew he'd be strong. She, yeah. she knew, and yeah. and and there was something that suggested that that maybe yeah maybe he would stray with the sister. But but then it was just a, a sort of I think she assumed it if she if he did then it would just be a physical act and they would just you know he the the man would have his way as 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 he does and 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 that would be it. So, yeah, I would have know. Well, Leon on his wedding night, remember, he's like looking over at Junan, who he just married. And he's like, I mean, this isn't going to be the only woman I'm ever with. There's yeah. always, you know, you know, like that was just part of the culture. So I think Junan's assumption is the way that we like assume there's going to be an ATM on every corner in a city. You know, like, like that's just how it is yeah. <laughs> for the time, really. And she wow. was right. His thinking on his wedding day was I'm going to I'm going to have all these side pieces. <laughs> that's what he that's what he thought <laughs> you know so when a guy is away at war for a couple years at a time you know sometimes there are unsaid agreements no i i know i know but i'm saying on his wedding night before he was even shipped away he's already thinking well mm. he's you know yeah yeah I can't say well, I think, you know, if I was in his shoes, be like, okay, I'm young, I'm getting tied down. No, it's okay. It's not going to be forever. <laughs> you have to unscare yourself. <laughs> Tamara's laughing at me. <laughs> the truth is that I'm really just a dude with boobs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I and it's funny because even though he was like the main male character of the male characters, he was my least favorite. I totally loved Huran. Huran is the best. <laughs> like mm -hmm. Huran's son, I really liked him. Yeah. Oh, I like Luan Leon. I liked him a lot. I knew you would. Let's go. How did go, you know go. that I would like him? Okay, I gotta know. How did you know that I would like her husband? Because we have spent over a year discussing characters, some of them male, who have strayed on the podcast. So well, I already know where you come down. Defending men who stray. <laughs> That's your thing. That is like the corner you will champion. All love conquers all. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm thinking, see, so you justify his leaving the daughter because his, see, you see it as him leaving Junan to be with Yinan, who is his the one love true love. of his life. And then sure. she turned around and said, well, fine, you can't have the love of your life. I'm just going to take the kids, essentially. But, but there's a part of me that's like, He's ultimately choosing Yanan over his daughters. I'm yeah. sorry. If you use your children for emotional blackmail, you don't get to spend the next 50 years of your life making a man miserable. He could have found a way around it, though. He doesn't have to live with um, Junan, but he can still live in Taiwan in a different house with Yanan and Yao. He, his like, whole he could... point was to get them out. <laughs> he wanted yeah, them he all did. together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I guess what I'm saying is he could have also gone to Taiwan with Yanan and Yao, if he cared enough about his daughters, but he didn't. Honestly, the way they left it, I kind of don't blame him. Can you imagine them in the same city? Hmm. It's his daughter. <laughs> okay, Gerald, Gerald, <laughs> as a man with a daughter. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> Gerald, look around, see if your wife is within listening distance before you answer this question. <laughs> well... <laughs> The fact, the fact that my wife isn't isn't the mother of my daughter sort of <laughs> complicates things. Anyway, yeah, um, I I I don't I. I okay, don't let's know. put it I in modern it. terms. Let's put it in modern terms. You're with somebody that you know that you should not be with. If you stay with them, you're going to be miserable for the rest of your life. You have a love of your life, and you have a choice. If you go with the love of your life, then this woman 
who you really don't want to be with is going to take your kids away. From I don't you. like the way Maya is setting this question because she has completely left out the children. I just said, <laughs> going to yeah. take your children away from you. Do you choose to be miserable for the rest of your life in order to have 10 years with those kids? Or do you choose to be with the love of your life? Given the fact that she's a controlling need to be miserable for the rest of your life to be just miserable for the next 16 years <laughs> there are way i mean in, in, um, in western countries and in modern times you can be part of your children's life and not be with the person <laughs> that's make, making you unhappy that that's these things are possible so but, but, but this is a different the, time. Oh, yeah, uh, but to take the kids away like that is a little harsh, I think. I think she was a little harsh too. They oh, well, could have okay, co-parented. They could have done the whole Frida Kahlo, Diego Rivera had a house with a bridge. They could have done it. <laughs> yeah, the, I'm, I, you can't see my face right now because I'm sad. I know you're sad. Okay. <laughs> I, I also, that. yeah. I sort of also take umbrage with the idea of Junan took his daughters away. No, Junan took her daughters to Taiwan where they could lead lives like those that they had been accustomed to and not be persecuted by the communists on the mainland. Like moving the girls to Taiwan is because of those were the girls. And what was the last thing she said to him when he begged her, when he begged her for them all to go together? What did she say? Don't make me look it up. I can't. <laughs> I remember at one point Jinan was like she w wanted to stay in the mainland too for whatever reason I don't know I mean anyway. it's, it's situations like this there's no here's what I'm saying I'm not saying he's he did all the right things I'm saying in situations like this there is no black and white it is all a messed up pile of gray that looks a little bit like baby poop and no matter what you choose, yeah, no, I agree. you're kind of yeah. <laughs> still in the middle of it. I mean, don't don't get me wrong. At the end of the book, when Leanne is sitting there with all of his regrets, and he's saying that whole thing about how maybe the reason he couldn't get close to his son is because he had left his daughters, I felt for him. I cried for him. I'm still capable of feeling for him. But this is also part of me that's like, you did abandon your daughters. But, but you know, even, even when people are dying off right, left, and center, and, and, and people are frail and ill and old even then junan says no i don't want to, I, I don't want anything to do with any of you she she's she is so cold she's very cold yeah she would not have she's the general she would not if he had gone with her there was no way that he could have showed up on her doorstep and she would have let him in there's no way she was too angry i i don't see how oh, that yeah. was even possible and Honestly, I, I feel a little bit like you made your bed. So, <laughs> because she was so just cold and heartless in how she treated him, how she treated her sister, how she treated her daughter, even before this all happened, the way she treated her sister, the way she controlled her sister, forced her into this arranged marriage that her sister really didn't want, mm -mm. was trying mm -mm. to, and then started to regret it because then she realized, oh, well, now she's unhappy. It was all about control her, make her into the type of woman that I think is acceptable. And in controlling people, she pushed everybody away. Yeah, but I do remember the first time she heard that her sister was going to get engaged to the old guy. She felt bad for her sister. Yeah, but she remember? started that whole mess. Her sister didn't want to get married at all. No, it was the father. The father was no, the one who was like, I got this letter. Went to the from father this guy. Originally, the sister went to the father and said, we need to talk about getting her married off after she found the candy. And that's when the dad started sending out letters. Dad was perfectly happy to sit on his butt. <laughs> okay, Tamara. <laughs> What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? I just want your general opinion and thoughts on the question of Junan. Horrible snake woman, as per Maya. <laughs> horrible snake woman. Damaged woman with lots of baggage. <laughs> or, or, I, well, I can give my thing later. Tamara, thoughts on Junan. Horrible snake woman, potentially. <laughs> I, I don't think she was a horrible snake woman, but I do think she was damaged. 
And I don't think that her need to control came from a cold place. I didn't think she was a cold woman. I thought that she, that her control that she had to, she had to, she felt like she had to cover herself up in all of these layers of control. She felt too much like her mother. She felt like she was entirely too vulnerable if she left herself open. She was afraid that she was going to end up in a lake. So I did not think she was a horrible snake woman. I thought she made some terrible choices, but I didn't hate her. Yeah. The entire time. Yeah. No, I didn't hate her. Yeah. I actually felt really bad for her. Oh, yeah. And I felt like I was watching a train wreck. Hmm. Yeah. And I see the thing was, I didn't see. So I felt bad for her too, but I think I felt bad for her for slightly different reasons. Like, yes, she is an incredibly vindictive person. She has like the world record in holding grudges, but I feel, and the thing, but I feel like her biggest, biggest mistake was thinking that by providing a safe, stable environment with things, by providing wealth, that's all she needed to do. She forgot that people need warmth and nurturing as well, but I feel like people didn't give her enough credit for how resourceful she is, how she really pulled her family through a terrible war. And I feel like people, I mean, that, I feel like a lot of the choices that she made was for the sort of like insurance of her daughter's future. Like even in her control of everything, she was controlling to make sure that her kids would be okay. And I feel like people didn't give that its due credit. I felt like that she was very much respected in the story. I felt like the other characters in the story looked at her with admiration for her strength and her ability to keep her family together and to provide for them. And I felt like she very much was given respect for that. Um, my, my biggest sadness in the story is that looking at you can see how so much this could have been prevented if she just would have opened up and allowed herself to express how she was feeling you know to be married with somebody and be in love with somebody and not tell them that you love them is huge it is huge and she was so afraid of love that for me her original error wasn't all the controlling later on it was her own covering up and controlling of herself earlier on in the marriage that doomed it in the end because he needed that passion but she didn't see that she saw a husband needs a son that's all he needs if he has a son he'll stay she didn't consider that if she loves him maybe he'll stay and that's cultural at that time but it was really sad because so much of that could have been prevented and, and to a certain degree she was right too because remember a lot of her thoughts was i can't say it i can't I can't be impulsive and confess my love to him because that's not what I'm supposed to do. And way later in the book, when Li Nan is already in Taiwan and he thinks about going back to the mainland to find Yanan, the love of his life, he was thinking, he's reflecting on Yanan. He remembers that he was perturbed by how she was so forthcoming with her love and how she was so warm. Like basically the very thing that Yunan was afraid would happen was kind of true until he got was over Was he it. perturbed because she expressed her love or was she he perturbed because... She expressed it so recklessly, given their situation. And it put him in a spot where he had to own up to what he was feeling and had to make a choice. If somebody doesn't say Actually, they love you, then you can kind of, you know, waver in the gray area and not be forced into a decision. I'm going to find it real quick. Let me look for it. You guys keep chatting. <laughs> look at her. Looking up stuff. Yeah. Well, I thought that um, one of the things he admired about Junon was the fact that she was kind of self-contained like he liked that about her yes <laughs> agreed <laughs> okay. originally yes because he could rely on her but, but they're, they're okay so kind of strange oh, like, yep go ahead been there all the way through and 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 the, there were times when she she was contacting him and 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 he was just ignoring her. He, he was not replying to her telegrams and 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 stuff like that. It, it's I don't know. They're just a real pair. Of... But how do you reply to someone's telegrams when you're stooping the sister? <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so Why are you I, this me? is the thing. So he, <laughs> <laughs> You're a man. So he's into. <laughs> Okay, so he's in Taiwan and he's remembering his time with Yunnan and Chongqing. And he says he remembered Chongqing day and night. His memories were like an illness that caused everything around him to fade into the world of a dream. She had said she was in love with him. He had known that this was too true, but her artlessness, her candor had unsettled him. Once she made her declaration, there was no way to disregard what had happened. So it's that sort of like culturally confessing this is something that seems to disturb men, but then he likes it. And that's why Yanan is the love of his life. See, you're you're chopping it up to culture. I think that it unsettled him because he couldn't ignore it afterwards. Just like he said, once it was out in the open, once it was said in plain language, that forces the mm. issue. You can't have mm. her in the house and pretend like everything's fine if she said out loud, "I am in love with you." Yeah. Yeah. What a mess. Maybe a bit of column A, column yeah. B. Mm-hmm. It's a tasty mess. Also, who's the MVP of the story? <laughs> <laughs> Only you would come up with that question. Yeah. yeah, because as soon as I finished the book, I was like, Humudan. Humudan is the MVP. Yeah, yeah. Like, she makes everything happen. She's pretty awesome. She's amazing. She's she, pretty she's, awesome. Yeah. She's buzzing around in the background, isn't she? And she's, you know, she's a go between. She's, a, uh, she's an organizer. She's, a, she, she's, yeah, she's awesome. She's, awesome. she's trying to keep the family together, you mm. know, and she's really living up to her love for the mother originally and that feeling of sisterhood and friendship they had. And she is acting on that even after her death, even long after, um, you know, Jinan doesn't want to talk to her anymore. She's still behind the scenes making sure everybody's okay. Yeah. Um, and, and there was something else in the story. So towards the end, when they're going back, uh, when, you, when Hong, the narrator of the story, Junan's first daughter, mm. she goes back to the mainland to see her father and she has a sort of reconciliation and she thinks, okay, well, it had all come out all right in the end. She says that twice. But then later in the story, she's talking to Hua about her marriage to Puli and she's saying how, I know how Puli was supposed to marry you. He wanted to marry you. And then Hong is like, okay, but now you guys love each other. So what does it matter? And she says, no, it still matters. Yeah. Where do you guys come down on this divide? I can see how Everyone that's painful. <clears throat> I think it did still matter. Um, deep down inside, there's always a sense that even though you love each other now, originally you weren't the one that was chosen. That's got to be painful. Hmm. Tomorrow looks like she's pondering something deep and important. Well, I'm trying to put myself emotionally in that situation. I don't think I'd be able to let it go. Mm. I think I would carry that with me. Yeah. I, I, and I think so. I, th I think all of the characters are carrying not only their own baggage, but seemingly the baggage of, of previous generations too. And, th and they're carrying it all throughout the story. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, of course it's going to matter to them. So... Mm. You know, it is intricate, but I feel like it's a very traditional story. Um, you know, I was, after I read it, I was looking at some of the reviews and one of the things, Sam is the director at the Iowa Writers Workshop and she's only written two novels, but she is an amazing teacher. And one of the things that was mentioned was they expected, you know, somebody that runs a workshop like that would be writing something that was very experimental and new and whatever. But um, this story felt very traditional in feel. It was very linear. Um, it unfolded slowly and was beautiful and artful, but I felt like it had almost an old fashioned quality to it. And I can't put my finger on what it is that's giving it that feel to me. I wonder if it's a little bit of the lyrical language. So this is probably the one place where I think I had moments where I absolutely loved it. And other moments where I was like, okay, that's a bit much. So, <laughs> you know, this is probably like my only like one tiny like little tick. Um, so, for example, when the grandmother dies, when Junan's grandmother dies a few days before Hong is born, I thought it was like a really cool description of like a villain death. Um, let me see. Yeah, it was an amazing description of when she died. <laughs> yeah, it, it was. It's like one line. It's um, 
Hong is saying, I was carried to full term and born in the early spring of 1933, the year of the rooster, only days after my great grandmother, Ma, sparing herself from the disappointment of the birth of yet another girl, drew her last resentful breath and let her soul depart from her body in a blur of bat like wings. <laughs> that visual was like a great, just like, oh, there, it's like, there goes Maleficent, her last breath, <laughs> right? So there were some things that really worked for me, but then there was a few others where I thought, for me, it almost came off a little like melodramatic in some places. I don't know if you guys ever had that sense or if it was just No, me. I didn't have that sense, but I love lyrical literary writing mm. to almost an absurd degree. Um, so, I mean, and I felt like, okay, I hate to make a comparison, but the lyrical writing in Fate and Furies, that to me was a little much. <laughs> Yeah, this to me was much more artfully done. It was much more delicate. It, it felt like she wrote with a much more delicate hand. Whereas there was points in the story where I felt like the author was like, look at me, see how awesome I can use the words. Um, this one didn't have that sense for me. Maybe when I talk about the melodrama, maybe I just missed something. So I think the one, the, those will be the only one time where I like, drew my head back and I was like, really? It was when Hong lost her virginity to Hu Ran, and part of her description of that I felt is, I could sense around our room the city in flames. The streets were turning upside down. China burned. R rulers fell away and towers crumbled. And I'm like, oh, you only lost your virginity. So that's what I mean by the melodramatic. <laughs> it was melodramatic. There was a difference in class. This was somebody she wasn't supposed to be with. She's not supposed to be having sex. She's to somebody else this was going to rock her existence if anybody found out yeah so yeah. for me yeah that's felt fair, totally but... appropriate and i like the fact that that's how it was described rather than having a traditional love scene where you got the throbbing whatever is in the heating oh, no. <laughs> it was a metaphorical <laughs> love scene that worked for me yeah yeah, yeah it, 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 it... Yeah, I never, I never sort of mm -hmm. really felt the, the lyrical language intruded. I, I, I always thought it, it supplemented and, and I just went along with it. It, it seemed to be appropriate at the time. Mm. Um, I liked it. Yeah, <laughs> just straight up. Just... <laughs> You're the poet. <laughs> I like I like it. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd say in, in the beginning when, so Gerald and I said the beginning was a little slow, I think also part of what made it slow was some of the kind of cultural and societal scandals. I hadn't yet been immersed in this world, so I didn't really care about the upsets of those scandals as I did later once I was in this world fully, mm -hmm. you know? And I did notice that. I remember in the beginning that something would happen, it was like, dun, 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 and I'm like, uh... <laughs> I'm not there yet. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> I, I, I think that's yeah. that's, and that's quite difficult when when somebody's writing about uh, a whole different um, a whole different world to to the to the one that you're uh, you're living in and the one that you're aware of, and, and it, it takes a little while to to sort of get used to that that world. And I I felt almost as if at the start she was making assumptions about the people reading it. And, and yes, she was straight in with the story, and yes, she was straight in with the characters, but it, it sort of it, it felt hard to digest for me initially. That's that's all. Yeah, and I think you're right, Annie. It's it's it's, it's a different world. It's a different uh, a different environment, and, and I think you. I don't know. I, I I don't know what you can do about that. I, if you're writing well, in that world, you, you you know you're writing in that world. There's nothing you can do about it. I actually appreciate that she didn't do the whole intro info dump, get the non, get the foreigners to understand what's going on thing that you see in a lot of literature. I felt like so much of diverse literature, it's like there's crib notes to let the people that aren't part of that group get it before they get into the story. And I like the fact that she just expected you to either stay with the story or to have previous knowledge. I felt like this was a book that was written for people that would get it and that we just happened to be enjoying it from the outside, whereas being written for a super wide audience um, because she didn't really go into a lot of cultural explanations. And I felt like that made it easier for me to feel immersed in the story rather than having to translate it and be thinking about it. 
Yeah. And I, I, and I like that as well, because even though I might be lost on certain things, I still, it almost feels like I'm like sneaking in or partaking in something that wasn't for me. It has this kind of voyeuristic quality that I enjoy. Right. Cause it's clearly not written for my demographic, but I still love it. And I feel like, Ooh, I get to participate. <laughs> How about you tomorrow? Um, the beginning for me was kind of slow, but that's because there were so many characters kind of introduced immediately. And I feel like that when I'm reading sci-fi that's like that or fantasy, when there's just a lot of names and people and I'm trying to figure out who is what and where, it you know, it just drags us reading down for me a little bit. But it's not a bad thing. It's just it's just what it is. I, I drew a family tree because I, I, I had to I had to know who everyone was in relation to each other. So, um, so it's, I it's thought a, about that, but I'm too lazy. Yeah. I just kept reading and figured I'd remember eventually. Yeah. <laughs> I remember it wasn't important. Like, okay, which one is this? Okay, it's that one. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Though I, I'll say there were some things then about her writing that then I would wonder, I'm like, is this an author thing? Is this just Lan Samantha Chang or is this a Chinese thing? So, for example, a lot of times when they were describing beauty or young women, it was always their throats. I'm like, so is this a cultural fascination with throats or is this the author? Like, I didn't know how to separate that sometimes. Well, there was a cultural obsession with throats back then. Um, that's one yeah. of the reason why Geisha, the young ones, they, they leave the back un without the white that was considered an erogenous zone. And so mm -hmm. they, her whole face and neck would be all covered in white and then there'd be this like little spot in the back that was bare skin. Um, so I think some of the descriptions are just her, um, given that I've read her other books. She writes in a really delicate way. And um, so some of that's her, but I think some of it was her portraying the culture and time as well. Mm -hmm. There's also lots of bones. So since you've read her other books, does she have lots of bones? No in the other, other bones. Books? No bones. Okay, no other bones. Just this book with the bones. <laughs> well, I, I think the bones are a good metaphor for, you know, so much has gone on in the family because of death. And they really are a skeleton of a family by the end. Um, I think the constant repetition of bones if it wasn't done on a, a, a like conscious level it definitely was a subconscious theme throughout the book yeah, yeah I, think so. it's I don't think this author writes subconsciously though i think everything's very intentional mm -hmm. i do too yeah. especially yeah. given the notes that she gave me on my work <laughs> <laughs> Imagine taking a super messy manuscript to that woman. <laughs> now you get it. <laughs> Harold, you were gonna say? Uh, yeah, just just about, yeah. I, I like I like the fact that that that, that idea of, that the family is just is just a, a skeleton, and and the it was such a, a, a rich. A rich family, it was a rich characterization in in the sort of center section. But then towards the end, it was almost as if it was almost as if she that the spirit had gone out of them. So she 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 did keep talking about the skin over the bones and bones protruding and 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 they were small and withering away and all that sort of stuff. So and and, and I like the fact that that was. That was also a metaphor of what was happening in families, so that they, there was just the the skeletons of the people connected together. But but it seemed like their their characters had fallen by the wayside too, and they were they were just struggling to to sort of make sense of of what what the family was after all this time. Yeah. And and similar to Fates and Furies, Fates and Furies had that current of grief throughout it, and I feel like this one did too. Um, but this one treated a little bit differently. So I, I remember in Fates and Furies, the grief that she described so delicate. Well, no, 
Groff doesn't describe delicately. The grief that Groff described, like, <laughs> like the an top was very, <laughs> yeah, was, was the, the raw emotion in the moment, where Chang more delicately is talking about sort of like the fading of memories. There was a point where Hong is thinking about who ran and she's struggling to recall how he felt, how he smelled, how he looked. And that just, it, I, I, that was one of my, I cried several times throughout yeah. these books, but very emotional. That was one of them. So I just, if anything stood out to you guys about that grief. Um, Both for the dead and for the still living. Yeah, yeah. Grief was definitely really strong. And the sense that love can be so painful, you know, um, it made me really sad. And it brought up a lot of baggage of my own. And it felt very personal as I was reading it, partially because it was so delicately written, but also because the emotions felt so bare, um, you know, to as I was reading it, I was feeling all the characters' emotions. And that's something that I don't think we've talked about. Um, I feel like in this book, it didn't matter what character we were talking about, I felt their emotions. I felt connected to every single character in this book, even the minor characters. And that is hard to pull off. And I haven't had that experience in a while. You know, and there were also, a, a, there was a moment when I started laughing too. Like I was very emotionally engaged in, throughout the entire book. I was going to ask, when did you laugh? Because I'm trying to think of when I laughed and I can't I can't remember, remember because the ending was so traumatic that I blocked out. But I remember I was, I was laying down and I was reading and all of a sudden I laughed and I looked at the clock. I was like, oh no, I'm going to wake the neighbors. Um, but I can't remember. It was probably like a third into the book. And I remember that it wasn't something that was overtly funny, but there was so much built up tension. It, it was just funny enough that I couldn't stop. I just, I let out a laugh. I was like, whoa, that was unexpected. Yeah. And I cried too. And I felt sad and I, I cursed at the characters and all of it. I cried really hard for Yanan. I feel so bad for Yanan throughout. I just, she, she was, she, I feel like she's a girl in over her head who just. She, and she, I don't think she knew. I mean, she knew she wasn't like she was supposed to be, and and she was sort of a free spirit and and, and different. Um, but she, she, I think she was really struggling to find out what her purpose was. <laughs> <laughs> Having a lot of noise today. <laughs> Yeah. I'm like, she turns it off, and then we got a freaking leaf blower. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm doing everything I can. You know, She's I'm like, you've got to, to be kidding me. <laughs> you should all come and live in my house. It's very quiet. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, Gerald, you were saying I didn't catch the last bit of it. Um, you were saying... Oh, crikey. Um, Yanan. Yeah, yeah, she, she, yeah, she, she was, she was just this, yeah, a sort of free spirit of, of a character where, where girls weren't supposed to be free spirited, and and there was one point where she, I can't remember which one it was, she was meeting her suitor, and and she spoke up, and and the suitor said, no, I'm not interested, and she thought it was because she'd spoken, and and but mm. she she was always wanted to be something different, so do something that wasn't expected of her i liked her yeah i liked her too i liked and her it, it it was painful to watch how her life unfolded and you know there was always this sadness in her that never left you know even when she was happy she was miserable <laughs> and that made me really sad i'm like even when you are finally with the love of your life, you have the weight of the world on your shoulders. You are still miserable. What's what's and 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 the thing is, Junan wanted to hurt her for what she did, and Junan Junan will do whatever she wants. Like she, her will conquers everything. She willed decades before that Leanne will come to me begging one day, and then it happened. Right? Like <laughs> yeah. she makes things happen, and 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 it's got to be terrifying and hurtful to be on the opposite side of that, like Yinan was. Did, I mean, was was Liang the love of Yinan's life? Or yes, just... definitely. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I, their love, their love was real. I mean, when when 
the fact that Lian went to Junan when Yinan is dying, yeah. <laughs> all those names, you know, because you even, I mean, imagine what that must be like going to the woman who has ostracized your family and been punishing you for decades and getting over that and going to her begging because it will make your wife happy. You know, your current like that. Yes. He definitely loved her and she loved him. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I also felt bad for Yao. <laughs> like this poor kid doesn't know the true story of his life. And then all of a sudden here comes Yanan and her new husband, Tom. And he's like spilling all these secrets, right? He's like talking about like his upbringing and he's, you know, the communists persecute him and stick him out on like uh, a farm where he's like doing hard labor because his dad was a general in the war. His whole story too. I'm like, that's a whole separate book. And yeah. I feel there's like no happy character no. except maybe Hong's girls. And honestly, um, I, I think that's one of the things that I respect most about the story because it would have been really easy to tack on a happy ending or to give you a happy character. And I think that's one of the things that I appreciated was the bittersweetness of all the characters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, and I think mm-hmm. even, even the, the, the controlling Junan, who was, who was the matriarch of the family, um, even she was, even her character was, was, was dealt with very delicately and very carefully. And she wasn't, there was like a, a, a sort of like a peaceful power in her so she she wielded control over the family but she wasn't this big sort of shouty um person this angry person this person who would argued with people she you know but she everybody knew she she was in control yeah anything else well i mean add? we talked a little bit about the symbolism of the bones did you guys see any other symbolism in the book there was lots of water <laughs> and stone and wood. It was very kind of earthy in a way. It was very much about, because I think also the bones is the kind of like the passing down of, of you know, like genetics in a way, both the, the story part of it, the biological part of it, because things kept repeating themselves. Chan Yi had two daughters and then Junan had two daughters. Like her first daughter had two daughters and her first daughter Hong had two daughters. Like these things that keep repeating themselves over and over. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, thought it was, I don't know how the water necessarily yeah. comes in aside from the opening though, that her life story is like a stone being cast in the lake, like Chan Yi. There's that connection. There is that, but also, I mean, this story really centers on women and water is very fluid and has traditionally been a female, a feminine element. And so I think there's that as well. Mm -hmm. No. Tamara? No. She's still there? No, no, no. She's there. She had to, she's been trying to pause it when she's not talking because it gets really bad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anything else to add? We're already coming up on the Yeah, I, I don't have anything. Here. Okay, so instead of rating on a scale of one to six, we rate it in a sentence <laughs> because we don't want the problems of numbers again. <laughs> um, so if you had, is so it just kind of sum up your feelings, whether or not you'd recommend it, what you think about it in like a sentence, the takeaway. I love this story so much that it has now become my favorite novel of all time, along with All is Forgotten, Nothing is Lost. Those are my two favorite novels. They literally knocked Anna Karenin down to number three. Wow. What an endorsement. I, Gerald? Yeah. This, this is one of the few novels I really want to read again um, because I think there is so much to it and it is so enjoyable it, it's 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 amongst my favorite three novels of all time yeah oh i'll go since the mayor has a plane um for me 
I really, really, really like this book. And I think this one's pretty accessible. So sometimes with literary novels, it's kind of like you need to like work your way up to have the patience to read it. I think this one's very accessible. And if you're thinking of dabbling in literary fiction for the first time, this is a good place to start. Stick with it. Stick with the, the perhaps slow and difficult start. I'm glad that um, this was the book that I was able to read with you guys. Um, I would definitely recommend this to people. It's it's gripping. It's beautiful. I love that family is in itself a character. And yeah, I would de definitely recommend this. Hmm. Well, you should read books with us in the coming months as well. See what else we come up with on the show. <laughs> Um, speaking of which, next month we're reading Your Heart is a Muscle the Size of a Fist by Sunil Yappa. The episode will be published the first Friday of the month, which in April is April Fool's Day. In the meantime, as you read Yappa's novel, let us know your thoughts on Twitter with the hashtag LRH Book Club or leave comments on our Facebook page or our website, literaryroadhouse.com. And if you don't, we may suspect you're holding a multi-generational, multi-continental grudge against us in the spirit of you. <laughs> <laughs> Bye guys. Bye -bye. <laughs> You'll get used to her outros. They're kind of brilliant. <laughs> <That was> magical. <laughs> really magical. Okay. Yeah.